honored to have uh, yeah. Moya with us here today. Uh, for those who don't know, Moya is the CEO of Rural Mail for the last eight years and will be transitioning over the next few months. Um, she previously was the CEO of Canada Post. Um, in 2013, Moya was the first ever woman to be given the prize of Business Person of the Year by the uh, New York, uh, by the um, uh, Sunday Times. She has an OBE. This Saturday, she was made a dame, a dame as well, which is an incredible honor of uh, your, your achievements. Um, she's on the board of EasyJet. She's on the board of Rio Tinto, um, and just recently has pulled uh, the Royal Mail back into the FTSE 100. So congratulations on Thank such you. great achievements. So Moy and I are both Canadian. Um, I lived a part of my life in Toronto, and you were. I was born in Newfoundland, but spent most of my career in Toronto too. Right, and if you read the news recently, with sort of Canada and the U.S. now are slightly. Uh, um, uh, at, uh, at, at ease with some of the terrorists, but I'm flying to San Francisco this afternoon. I just hope they'll welcome me. <laughs> they <But> will. <laughs> we'll have a very pleasant conversation. Um, so Moya, there's a lot of people here on data science and stuff. What I really want to focus on today is how uh, the realities of a big, chunky, traditional company like the Oral Mail, how are you using data and AI uh, to drive sort of more value? And more importantly, how have you driven that change? What have you personally learned? And so if we look at some of the business results, um, your courier business is, I think, declining 4 to 6%, but your parcels are growing 6 to 10. You've got Amazon coming in with uh, much bigger budgets on technology and AI. How will you remain competitive, and what's been your technology focus? Well, we're going to remain competitive because we are the best at what we do. And, uh, even before we had as much technology under our products and our offer, we had a group of people in delivery who have very high quality delivery as part of their DNA. Uh, in fact, uh, there is nobody in the world who delivers to a higher regulatory standard than we do at Royal Mail. But it is true, we had a major transformation to do, a major modernization to do. I used to joke, but it wasn't completely a joke, that our technology was state of the arc in 2010, and thankfully it's not anymore. Um, we, and I suspect every business has got to put a huge amount of technology underneath that business or they're not going to be in business. And certainly Royal Mail had to change almost every aspect of its operations. We were a company that had been chronically underinvested for a long time. We hadn't made any money in our home market for many years. We were cash negative. Uh, we had a very, uh, I think, punitive and perhaps uh, unnecessarily uh, restrictive regulatory approach. And it is fair to say that we didn't have a very good relationship with our people, our employees. And at the end of the day, any change you make is going to be with your people, going with your people, not against your people, or else the change is going to be very successfully resisted. So how are we going to remain competitive against uh, really wonderfully innovative, great global companies like Amazon? By continuing to change and continuing to be the best at what we do. And uh, over the past four years alone, we have spent 1.9 billion pounds in the UK. And about half of that has in some way, shape, or form been at rebuilding first the technology backbone of our company and then taking more of the technology capability in-house. We used to outsource technology. We, at, uh, in 2010, we had a single provider. We then went via the biggest technology procurement in Europe at the time to five technology providers. But while we were moving the technology backbone and relying on and diversifying our risk across those five, at the same time, we were rebuilding the technology capability inside the company. So we've gone from 60 people in technology in the days of the bad outsourcing to now 585 people in technology, of which our data scientists are treasured resources. You know, we don't, uh, Kareem is right, we, we don't have uh, the kind of, of, of money to spend that Amazon does. Every pence at Royal Mail has to count, but, and we have made it count. So, so when you think about the things that have worked and haven't worked, my issue with AI, and people know this, is that I think a lot of it is, is hot air. 
um, those two magical letters, you put them on your title or you put them on your business card, all of a sudden people look at you differently. And I think investors are starting catching up on the fact that a lot of it is just not AI, it's just really smart predictive stuff. So when you think about the things that have worked for you, both in terms of internal functions, but also in terms of how you've driven great customer service, where has AI really, really worked for you? Well, I think you, know, you, you have to look at first your customer offer and uh, where AI has really helped us and new software and new uh, sensory technologies have really helped us is on the delivery side. First, as I mentioned, we had to rebuild the whole technology backbone. But about four years ago, we had enough of that rebuild done that we were able now to start adding on the sort of things that make it easier for e-retailers to connect their shipping systems to ours, and then finally make it easier for our people to actually uh, do the delivery and to prove the delivery and to prove the time that the delivery was made and to prove the time it took to do the delivery. Because what you will find in any business, I'm sure, like ours, there are many, many, many products. There are many streams of traffic. There are many services. They each have different attributes. You're selling those different attributes. So you need to know how long each segment of traffic is going to take you to process and how long it's going to take you to deliver. Let me give you just an easy example. It's a lot faster to deliver a pack of envelopes through a, a letterbox than it is to deliver a signed for parcel that is probably two or three kilos in weight. It just takes a lot more time. You have to stand at the doorstep. You have to wait. You have to wait for someone to sign for it. Sometimes the person's not home. That means you have to find a next favored place to deliver. All of this has been possible for us because of the technology that we have added to our products and services. And the, smart, the smart labeling that you... And it, it is way smarter now. Our people are able to say, I did deliver. I can confirm that I delivered. I can confirm that I delivered in that period of time. I can confirm that the promise that we made to our shipper around that deliver, delivery has been met. And that has helped us in numerous ways. We always knew generally how long it took to do the 60,000 walks Thanks, yeah. that we have to do every day. You know, we deliver 14 billion items a year. Uh, we deliver 1.2 billion parcels. We are the biggest and facilitator. And by the way, just to give you Amazon 350 million. Yeah, and we're 1.2 <laughs> billion. So, you know, there's not much about delivery and parcel delivery and being an e-commerce facilitator that we do not know. We are the biggest and we are the best in the UK today. And we actually operate now in 42 different markets for uh, with GLS as our subsidiary. So we're everywhere in Europe when we're now on the on the west coast of the US. So what technology has enabled us to do is to be far more precise. We always generally knew how long it was going to take us to deliver a particular uh, bit of traffic. Now we precisely know. Our people always felt great pride, and we were always regulated on the quality of our service. Now our people can confirm uh, with technology and report to shippers with reports that are uploaded, you know, immediately. Do you, take, do you take into account sort of weather and like whether is the M4 is down or how do you? Absolutely, we have to do that because we need a transportation system to deliver. If the airports are closed, if they close the M1 on us, you know, as they did four or five days before Christmas, that's a real problem. And so we have to get on to the highways agency and say, well, look, you know, I know you got to do work on there, but can you wait a few days? It is four days before Christmas. So all of those things are really important. Nobody knows more about what's going on in transportation in the UK than the Royal Mail does. But going back to technology and AI, we have used algorithmic decision making not just uh, in delivery and, and helping us be more precise about when we can deliver, what kind of traffic can be delivered in a particular period of time, but we also now use it in our back offices as well. And so, for example, in the whole order to cash area in finance, uh, we have used robotics and algorithmic decision making to take whole chunks out of that process. It used to be quite a laborious process with lots of drudgery yeah. in it and not always 100% accurate. So we've been able in the finance back office to get more accuracy and to do it faster, to get people paid faster by Royal Mail, for example. So that's another area we, where we have applied it. 
But as I say, you know, we're not Amazon. We can't take those very specialized resources, those data analytics teams that we have, and just willy-nilly let a thousand flowers bloom. We don't do that. We, we try to apply it to the places that are going to be most meaningful for consumers and consumers yeah. who are looking to know when their parcels are coming, to shippers who want to connect really complex shipping tools to our systems, and then, as I mentioned, also the back office systems. When you're a 10 billion pound turnover company, sadly, your, your back office systems are big, and uh, they take up a lot of resource. And I think you've got a robot called Myrtle or something in your uh, <laughs> HR function. In the <laughs> HR function, you know, that, that one we're still working yeah, on, okay. shall we say, Kareem. Fine, you know, that, fair enough. That there are certain things that are really great, and then there are other things that yeah, you are, know, not you so have, great. are not so great, and you have to keep working on them. Fair enough. Um, Listen, the, the, and let me shift the conversation to the leadership. And we know how hard it is to drive change. We recently did a pretty massive um, CEO study where we interviewed over 400 CEOs worldwide and asked them what are the things that we're really prepared for in taking the CEO role and what are the things that they really struggled. And over 50% of these really established CEOs said they underestimated the rate of change. So if I look at, and again, if I'm being a bit too naive, let me know, but if I look at the role mail a bit more traditional, you're not the Spotify of the world, you're not the Deliveroo of the world, so, or the Facebook. So technology is not part of your DNA. How do you drive these technology changes you just talked about um, in a culture that's not used to it? I mean, do you get backlash, do people accept it? Well, we have done a, a massive amount of change since 2010. We used to have 69 mail processing facilities. We now have 30. Uh, we were not sequencing mail as we processed this mail in the line of travel that a, a, a postman was going to deliver it. We, we weren't doing that. We had a huge amount of automation that had to be done. We didn't have our, our shipping tools, as I mentioned, were very clunky. It would take literally months for an online shipper to connect their shipping tools to ours. Now it takes days. So we have driven a massive amount of change. But you're right. If I look back on my career, and I'm old enough now to go back to you know, the IT revolution of the, of the 70s, what I think managers have always been is overconfident. They're overconfident about how long it will take them to implement a change. There are overconfident about how quickly individual human beings can adapt to change. You know, we used to joke when I was at Canada Post that, you know, nobody likes change. The only people that like change probably are babies. Uh, but, you know, once we get to be uh, seven, eight years old, uh, we get a way of doing everything. And the older we get, the more set we get in that way of doing something. And if it has worked for us for many years, it takes a lot of convincing uh, and a lot of time to help people understand that a change in the way in which they do something is going to make the task easier, better. And we have to be realistic. A lot of what I hear the technology gurus talk about does not seem realistic to me where they talk about us losing you know, 25% of the jobs as we know it in the next 10 years. I actually do not believe that that will happen. And even if you can write it down on a piece of paper and envision it, that is a very far cry from actually making it livable and real for people. So you know, when we're in a period of intense change, as I think we are now, mm -hmm. with robotics and AI and a lot of technologies converging in new ways to be able to do things uh, in a quite uh, different time scale than we would have thought possible even 15 years ago. I think it takes a bit of humility on the part of managers and certainly on the part of CEOs to say, look, this has got to be done ethically. We've got to realize that if you're like Royal Mail, where the average age of the people who work for Royal Mail, I did not build the brand, the wonderful brand, most trusted brand in the UK today. I didn't build it. Those people out in all kinds of weather every day, 100,000 people who know every town, village, and city, every neighborhood, they built the brand. 
And we need to be very respectful of how much change people can cope with over a particular period of time. And at the end of the day, if the change makes the company more efficient, I think yes, it does give you a competitive edge, but it comes with a human face. And so I always say to our regulator, who for good and valid reasons, they want to drive efficiency at Royal Mail, I always say, well, this is fundamentally a people business. And any efficiency, where does it show up? It shows up in fewer minutes being loaded into the operation to handle the many segments of traffic we have. If we can handle more traffic with fewer minutes, at the end of the day, it's going to spell fewer people. And so we have to be sensible, realistic, about how much change people can absorb. So on that one, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the future of work, because that's going to be a major discussion. Um, I think something else that you said was pretty interesting is that you need more coaches than surgeons to be able to drive change. And the other bit learning from us, from, all, from the study, is the fact that to be a CEO, you have to uh, two things, wear two hats. One is do, do the role of a CEO, which is the operational things of delivering against it. And the second one is being a CEO, which is going through your own personal growth. And you said a couple of key words, right? The days of command and control is completely out. Now, the best CEOs, the humble CEOs that knows very well um, that um, um, you know, they don't have all the answers and accept it. So let's talk about Moya as you as a person. I mean, what are the things reflecting on the last four or five years that you've learned about yourself in driving this change? Then I'm just as guilty as any manager. You know, I think that because I can write it down and I can put a plan together and I can envision how we will do things or, and how much better it will be, uh, that I am actually going to be able to achieve that. I have been wrong on that all the time. It takes longer. It just takes longer than you think for ordinary human beings to adapt to change. And at the end of the day, if people do not want to embrace the change, they won't. And so the fact that the wonderful technology community and the data analytics community that we have mm -hmm. to guide us to tomorrow is out there won't matter a whit if you cannot bring people with you. And so when people can envision that 25% of jobs are going to change, the next thing they have to ask themselves is, OK, well, how are we going to get all of those people to see that change as good for them as individuals, not just good for the companies or good for society, but good for them as and if, individuals? And if you think about your workforce, 140,000 people right in the UK. Big question around future of work. There's no question that. I'm guessing through AI technology, over time, that workforce will be reduced. And so if I'm sitting there as a postman, what, what are the, should I be worried about my job in the future? Um, and what are you doing to make sure that uh, they're going to be prepared and supported um, down the road? I think those are the two big questions. And what I would say is that I'm afraid change is inevitable. And especially in the business that we are in, where we are a facilitator of e-commerce. And so online retail is on the forefront of many of these changes. So I'm afraid that the change is inevitable. And if we're going to stay number one, we are going to have to go as fast as we can. But we're going to have to go with humility, communication, and a lot of tools to help people. Especially that your workforce money is 40, average 48, mostly blue collar, mostly physical delivery. Yeah, and so. it, it's just not true. When you hear the technologists talk about upskilling, again, I have been around long enough to see that there are lots of people who will not easily upskill. And so then we need to support them from an income point of view. Uh, we need to make sure that the transitions that they make from our company to some other walk of life our respectful transitions. So we have been able to reduce the numbers of people at Royal Mail, but always through voluntary redundancy. We give people an opportunity to put their hands up and to say, well, no, this is a bridge too far for me right now. I would rather transition out of Royal Mail. And we try to help with income support in that transition. We try to help with reskilling. But we also are realistic about reskilling. It's not going to be for everyone. So a lot of the claims that are being made around reskilling, I think, are uh, just 
a, a little romantic. I think you, I think you were pretty harsher about that view in backstage. So <laughs> I'm glad you're being much more diplomatic with us today. Um, the other thing about Moya is completely passionate about his diversity, and uh, it's a great opportunity for us to talk a little bit about the changes that you've done. Um, and I think your ratio of, I mean, just diversity, but also gender, women to men in technology and your senior exec is roughly 35%. 35%, yeah. But overall, it's, I think, 17%. So again, if, I look, if you look back at the last four or five years, what else could we do to help even all of us as leaders rebalance um, and close this gap of, uh, you know, diversity and gender in, in technology, but overall uh, in the UK? You know, if I look back at my time at Royal Mail, I'm not dissatisfied with what we've been able to drive at the managerial level. We've been able to get a reasonable amount of gender balance in managers by doing things like saying, look, all the lists for promotion and all the lists for new hires, we don't have a huge number of new hires because it's a company that has been shrinking, but where we do, we want them to be gender balanced, we want them to be 50-50. Where we haven't done very well is in the heart of the organization, which is the processing and the, particularly the delivery side. And I think I could have worked harder there, if I'm honest, uh, because there's no reason in the world why delivery should not be a gender balanced occupation. Um, I think the hours for people who are in delivery help. Uh, women manage families and uh, good, good careers. And I just now look back and I say, I'm sorry that I didn't work harder on that front because, you know, we had 42% of letter carriers in Canada where the weather conditions are sometimes much more inclement. We had 42% of letter carriers were female. Why is this, this not the case? And even though I have a huge respect for the executive on my union, uh, the CWU, one area where Dave Ward and I have had philosophical conversations that I probably could have gone more deeply on was how come that union still has 2,900 representatives and no females representing yeah. our workforce? Yeah. So I think if we can get the union structures in the United Kingdom to take on this gender diversity challenge more seriously than they have done, then people like me will have more success in the industrial heartland of the UK. But you know, for all that, I'm really glad that we are considered one of the top 50 employers in the UK for women. We are considered one of the top employers for uh, lesbian, gay, transgender people. Uh, and you know, that's really, really something when you have an industrial heartland as the base of your employment. So I think we have changed the consciousness around the issue. And the numbers, as I say, are good in technology and they're good in management. But I think I could have worked harder uh, on the industrial heartland. Well, I think it's a topic that everyone needs to work harder at. And you know, we're committed to supporting, um, you know, having you know, 25 female CEOs and by 2025, and it's kind of- You're gonna have to go pretty fast. I know, we're losing years. We're losing, we're, we're down losing. to six, but uh, <laughs> hopefully we can increase that. So last final question, because um, GoPro's tried it, Amazon's tried it, Just Eat's tried it, which is will we see in the next few years Roll Mail launch a drone delivery service to our homes? No. <laughs> you know, I pay attention, obviously, to... Because you said you'd be, I'd have to attach you to a drone yeah, myself. Yeah, you, 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 you're more likely to see me dropped in the backyards of London out of a drone. Uh, one of my colleagues said, uh, you know, uh, one of the most prevalent uh, uses for drones tends to be drugs in the penitentiaries. So, no, I think the, the airspace of the United Kingdom is going to be littered, but it's likely with planes, uh, not drones. Uh, drones have a place uh, in delivery, but very rare circumstances in remote areas, for example. It has to be very high value, medicines, for example, in remote areas. But, you know, you think about a conurbation the size of London, um, no. So the answer is no. The answer is no. Okay. Moya, thank you so much. You've been absolutely inspirational. Good luck with thank all your you. next moves. Fun. And we appreciate okay. your time. Okay, bye bye.